Ready? Okay, we're gonna be talking about congenital lung lesions this morning. Um, I do just wanna introduce Dr. Welch, who just wanted to sit quietly in the background, but he's one of the pediatric pulmonologists. So he joined us today too, and feel free to chime in. So, all right, this is just kind of talking about overview and management. Yeah. These, I originally gave this as a grand, round, grand rounds at UT, so it's not a military talk by any means. And then you'll see, I'm gonna talk about a surgical instrument that's uh, by Boulder Surgical. So one day, they haven't even given me dinner or anything, but maybe, <laughs> maybe one day I'll get something out of them. All right, so what can happen in a baby's lung? So mostly what we'll be talking about, CPAMs, so congenital pulmonary airway malformations. That whole, if you have old textbooks and they talk about CCAMs, just get rid of that terminology. We don't use it anymore. So CPAMs, bronchopulmonary sequestration, congenital lobar emphysema, which again, we're kind of getting rid of that terminology and moving into congenital lobar overinflation because it's not emphysema whatsoever. So congenital lobar overinflation, bronchial atresia, bronchogenic cysts, and then there's all these acquired things that happen in the lung, one of which can be congenital. So like a chylothorax can be congenital or acquired. And we'll just briefly touch on those at the end. So fetal lung malformations are as high as one in 2000 live births, but it wouldn't be a peds talk unless we talk a little bit about embryology, right? All right, so the different stages of development. Anybody have any idea how old this fetus is? Make a random guess. The key is like the little tail is kind of going away. Who said that? That's close, nine, so yeah. All right, so at this, at this baby's phase, the airway budding is already occurring, right? So they fall into this pseudoglandular. But we start at week four, and that starts developing really the more proximal airway. So everything kind of works proximal to distal. And that's important with these different lung lesions as to really where they develop and why they develop, right? So first you have the formation of the laryngotracheal bud from the anterior portion of the primitive foregut. So remember also it starts as this combined kind of esophagus, trachea, tube, and then separates. So when we talk about TEFs, it's in that early stage of development, right? And then we move into the pseudoglandular phase where airway budding occurs, and that forms the entire bronchial tree and the terminal bronchioles. 16 to 18 is the respiratory bronchioles form, and then that blood air interface matures. Then we get into the saccular phase, which is primitive alveoli. Uh, they form along with the production of surfactant. So now you're starting to think about premature babies. So premature babies, you know, we're really saving babies even down to like 22 weeks now. Like it's, it's getting pretty early, right? So at that point, they need surfactant typically, right? And we talk about their airway development is not complete when they're born that early. And then the alveolar phase is week 36 and beyond. So now you keep having this lung growth really up until early childhood. And, you know, kind of what age-ish, so around age eight or so, but basically when we do these lung resections earlier on in life, kids are still developing this alveolar growth phase so they can still compensate pretty well. All right, so the pathogenesis of the lung lesions are just largely unknown, but we think it has to do with transient fetal bronchial obstruction. And again, that's an importance of timing. So where in that process does this obstruction occur? It's a spectrum of um, anomalies, but with a common pathogenesis. So we see hybrid lesions like CPAM, BPS mixtures. Um, the pathology can kind of show everything. With CPAMs, a lot of them will have a bronchial atresia associated with it. So it's thought to be all kind of a big spectrum and we're not really kind of sure where that all lies. But faulty branching and budding of the lung by aberrant mesenchymal signaling. A lot of people are looking at steroids. They also give steroids to you know, premature babies, and maybe that gets rid of some of these signaling. We also give steroids for some of these really bad congenital lung lesions. So when baby is, has high drops and is about to really kind of have fetal demise, we give steroids and that helps. Extra lobar bronchopulmonary sequestration is the lung bud fails to connect to the pulmonary vasculature, but it means it maintains its splanchnic vessels. So Extra low bar, where does the blood flow usually come off of? Anybody know? Yeah, whoever said that. So off of the aorta. And so sometimes that can be pretty scary as you're doing it and you're looking at these images and you see this 
huge vessel coming off of the aorta, right? And it's coming up through the diaphragm. So you know if you lose control of that, it's kind of not, not ideal. And then intralobal bronchopulmonary sequestration is thought to be due to, initially it was thought to be due to a postnatal lung infection and injury. But now we're seeing all these prenatal diagnosed lesions. So really that's kind of been debunked. <clears throat> what else did I write here? So C-PAM specimens show more evidence of arrest of that pseudoglandular canalicular phase. And that's where steroids kind of help is moving into that next phase of um, development. All right, so CPAMs. CPAMs occur one in 10,000 to 35,000 live births. They communicate directly with the normal lung tissue via bronchial airways. So why is that important? Why is it important that they communicate directly? What does that kind of put the child at risk for? Infections. And when you get an infected CPAM and then operate, it's not, not as enjoyable of an operation. So they do not contain normal alveoli. They have poor gas exchange. 75% occur in the lower lobes. And then there's a stalker classification. And that talks about the location, the cystic structure, the epithelial lining. And you can see the different percentages here. So most are a type one CPAM. And then you get some type twos, very proximal is a lot less common. But really the main thing that we care about is macrocystic or microcystic. So if a kid's doing really, really bad prenatally from a macrocystic CPAM, does anyone know what you can do? Like really bad. Yeah, so we can actually go in and drain that cyst into the amniotic cavity. Right. And again, we're not calling these CCAMs anymore. So they're not this adeno adenomatoid lesion. So just focus on CPAM. All right, so prenatal management. <clears throat> so they can be a big range. Our ultrasounds are getting really, really good now, right? Prenatally, we can see all kinds of things. So I think that's why we end up probably doing, you know, more of these resections and everything is because we just diagnose them more commonly. So it can be asymptomatic. Often the consult we'll see is, hey, this was diagnosed on the 20 week anatomy scan. Kid's doing fine, but here it is. We're gonna follow it out. They can also get to the range of fetal demise, which is mostly from this fetal high drops. So up to 26 weeks, they have a rapid growth relative to the fetal size, and then it plateaus. <clears throat> After 28 weeks, it actually can reduce in size relative to the fetus, and then it can go way in the third trimester. So I've had a couple, um, actually even since being here, that hey, when they saw them prenatally, they're really small. By the last few ultrasounds, they're, they don't see them at, anymore. So the question is, did it go away or is it still there? Uh, I don't think it says it on my slide. So if we think it goes away, how does that change our postnatal management? Mm -hmm. So could, how do we evaluate to know if it's gone? Yeah, so we always get a CT scan in these babies. And it's really important for counseling too, from the MFM standpoint and from the surgery standpoint. So we'll meet with these moms prenatally and we explain to them that, hey, that's great. We're not seeing it anymore. That doesn't necessarily mean it's gone and we need to look and make sure it's not still there once the baby's born. And again, I think having that understanding, not just being like, oh, it's gone, nothing to do. Really that way, if something shows up on the CT scan, they're not kind of blindsided by it. All right, so the CPAM volume ratio, ratio, the CDR, is the volume of the CPAM to the head circumference. We can't just look at size, right? Because a 19 week fetus and a 36 week fetus, them having a two centimeter cyst is vastly different. So we're looking at the CDR and a ratio of one to 1.5 during that growth phase is when we refer to a tertiary center, meaning somewhere where they can do fetal surgery if they need to. If it's greater than 1.6, it's associated with an 80% chance of high drops. And then microcystic has the worst prognosis. So again, you just can't, you can't do a, like that thracoamniotic shunt if it's a microcystic lesion and they don't respond typically as well to treatment. 
So we're counseling a lot on this growth phase. And that's when really these moms need very serial imaging to make sure it's not drastically growing. And then you're monitoring for the CVR and the high drops. The steroid administration can be helpful if they're falling into that severe, big CVR standpoint. And then this hyperechoic to isochoic leads to this whole disappearing CPAM, which is why it might actually still be there because it's an ultrasound, right? <clears throat> So most of the treatment options, we talk about 28 weeks. So if at 28 weeks, the CVR is greater than 1.6 or less than 1.6, but with high drops, you give steroids. Again, you can attempt to cyst decompression. You can either shun it or actually just aspirate it too. And then if the CVR doesn't improve and the high drop progresses, we consider get to the point where we're considering open fetal surgery if they're less than 32 weeks or talking about early delivery plan. Has anyone heard of an exit procedure? Yeah, what's an exit procedure? Um, so basically, yeah, so you're using the placenta really as your anus, like your anesthesia, basically. You know, you, you don't need that secure airway. They're still connected to mom, and then you deliver the baby. So it's really good for like huge lung masses where you need to resect the lung mass and then get the kid intubated. The other option is doing a C-section with ECMO standby. So basically planning right away to put the baby on ECMO as soon as the baby's born and then doing the resection. All right, common or not common that we need to do anything for CPAMs as soon as they're born? Not very, very uncommon, right? So very, most of the time these are falling more in that asymptomatic standpoint. Right. So again, most are asymptomatic. So we get a chest x-ray prior to discharge. You don't wanna get it the minute the baby is born because they're still transitioning out into, hey, I'm alive into this world where I'm breathing air. Um, so we get it really kind of right before mom's about to be discharged or baby's about to be discharged. So you get that chest x-ray just to make sure that there's nothing kind of crazy. If baby's asymptomatic at that point, you're not really expecting to see anything, but it's kind of proving, hey, I don't see anything on chest x-ray. And then you're getting a CTA at two to three months of age they need to be at least four to six weeks. So they need to at least be beyond that level and why it needs to be. So really it should be a good study with the vasculature. So you need to be able to get an IV, be able to see the blood flow to be able to see if there's any systemic blood flow. And that helps a lot with your operative planning. And then these resections typically are done within about the first three to six months of birth of age. This has been shifted a lot younger. So I think before it used to be more like get a CT around six months, do their section closer to a year, kind of out. A lot of people are, well, now that we have better instruments and better ability to do thoracoscopic surgery and neonates, we're doing them earlier and seeing less inflammation. Um, babies just have more time to re recover and grow. And mostly it's kind of that lack of inflammation. So even if they don't clinically have a pneumonia, clinically have infections, there's more inflammation that you see when you do this operation later. So everyone gets a CT. So no matter what, you get the CT. And then if there's a CPAM, you're recommending surgery. Sometimes these are diagnosed much later in life. So if you have a bad pneumonia and you have what you think is a pneumatocele or a lung abscess, you do wanna make sure you re-image these kids after they were improve to make sure there's not like a residual lesion. So sometimes you'll get a bad pneumonia, think, hey, maybe there's something there. Is it just a lung abscess or is it gonna have a residual kind of CPAM and then schedule that operation once they're a little bit better. So this is an example of a kid with a CPAM. I think this kid has a type, had a type two, but looks totally normal on, on their imaging. Actually, this one was a mixed sequestration CPAM. All right, so why do we care? If it's asymptomatic, can we watch it? The risk of progression of symptoms is up to 86%, mostly being pneumonia. They can also have respiratory distress and they can have a spontaneous pneumothorax. If they present with a spontaneous pneumothorax, we're more concerned about a malignancy associated with it. Median age of 
uh, symptoms once they develop them is about age two, but this can range anywhere from one month to 13 years. Infection we talked about and then malignancy. So PPB, um, pleural pulmonary blastoma is one of the ones we talk about. This can be up in up to 5% of specimens. I've seen recently an article talking about up to 10%. Um, I think that was like later kids. Mucinous adenocarcinoma, and then long-term surveillance. You can't really do that, right? Like you can't say like, well, we're just gonna watch this and make sure it doesn't develop into anything because then what are you doing? CTing them every year, CTing them every two years. They don't show up on chest x-ray normally. So it just makes it a little bit hard from a cancer surveillance standpoint. The other thing about this is it's kind of hard to know, right? Like we don't really know long-term what the true risk of malignancy is because nobody's gonna be like, mm, let's just let's just see who develops cancer or not. So it makes it a little bit tricky. Make sure I don't have anything else. Oh, there's also recent evidence of KRAS mutations in CPAM specimens. So we could be seeing a higher risk of malignant degeneration than we thought. Um, but again, we don't really kind of know. So what are we trying to avoid? So this was a 14 year old male. So he had a CT of the chest done to actually evaluate scoliosis. And they got his beautiful lung fields in. Uh, it's not showing up real great. Hopefully you guys can see, is that projecting? Kind of see the cystic area down here. So previously he had had an intermittent cough, cough with rust colored sputum, but it kind of resolved. So I don't think he ever got evaluated or anything for it. His resection ended up being a mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma. So very rare, um, but that was his, his malignancy from a CPAM that was probably there since birth and just wasn't diagnosed. So 15 of 18 type one CPAMs have mucinous cell clusters. So is there a risk, a higher risk of developing these lesions? And then type one CPAMs account for 60 to 70% of cases of mucinous adenocarcinoma. There's this EGFR overexpression in KRAS. So this is what we don't want to get to, right? Is having a bad lung cancer in a 14 year old. These are other, um, and it's just not really projecting well, but you can see uh, down here, this whole kind of abnormal cystic area. And then he also had this lesion up um, in his upper lobe. So this was wedged out and then he had a resection of his uh, left lower lobectomy. All right, so PPD usually presents as recurrent infections or pneumothorax. There's different types. So cystic, that's usually in the very young children. Uh, we have a type one, type two, type three. They can present as a pneumothorax and typically there's a very poor prognosis. 25% are associated with other neoplasms. So PPB, sarcoma, medulloblastoma, leukemia, lymphoma, germ cell, all are possibilities. And we see a DICER1 gene mutation. So DICER1 is kind of the, the key PPB association. So it's the malignancy of the congenital lung cyst. If it's not excised, it'll evolve into a cystic solid or even a solid high grade sarcoma, which decreases the cure rate drastically. So pneumothorax and then bilateral lung lesions kind of characterize this PPB component, um, but you do need that histologic diagnosis. And the type four CPANs and PPBs aren't really easily differentiated. We think there's kind of this spectrum between the two. This is a very large type one. So this would be the kid that gets an immediate operation. You can see this was a kid in respiratory distress. This kid had another type one CPAM. So you see the radiology markers here. And again, the, um, the projection's not great, but this was one of those, hey, we're gonna get a chest X-ray at birth. See what we see. And you saw this big, simple kind of appearing cyst. Now we already knew that this kid um, had a prenatally diagnosed lesion. So we thought this is probably what that is, a CPAM, but I didn't do anything about it. So we have this x-ray and then just kind of still watch it. Um, and then this was a kid's CT. So now this kid, we know, hey, has this lesion. We know he has a CPAM. We know we need to operate. What do you guys think is really helpful about the CT in this baby? And this is a horrible CT. The kid was awake and moving and didn't get an IV and, you know. 
but I kind of found out the one thing I needed to know from the CT, so it was fine. No, it actually is normal. So this is the upper um, lobe. This one's down to the middle and that one's lower. So what operation are you gonna do in this kid? What was that? Yeah, so it told me whether it was gonna be an upper or middle lobe back to me. Alex, which one's easier? Yeah, so I was like, oh, all right, it's upper. So, so at that, was really the main question that I was answering on this CT is, is this upper or middle? The other thing is knowing that there's no systemic blood flow is kind of unlikely because of the location. Um, but you see how a less than two centimeter lesion looks really, really big in a baby, right? Like when you think about it, you're like, oh damn, that's only like this big, but it's kind of their whole lung. Right. This one is a 10 month old bilateral upper CPMs. Um, bilateral CPMs are really rare. They can occupy almost the entire lung, which is called chaos. So it's congenital high airway obstruction sequence. And a third of those kids progress to high drops or fetal demise. A third actually um, somehow kind of perforate their laryngotracheal atresia and then resolve. I don't know, babies, they're wild. And then a third will tolerate the high drops enough to get to an exit procedure. But their, so their obstruction is very proximal. So you think this happened much early on in, um, in gestation. So the fetal laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy will show complete laryngeal obstruction, and then they can do a tracheostomy and perform kind of surgery right away. But anyway, that's really rare. All right, so how do we take out CPAMs? So you can do a VATS or a thoracotomy. A lot of this is still kind of provider preference. Um, these look a lot bigger than they are, but mostly it was just so you can get the chest tube drain around it. Um, so one of these is a three millimeter incision, one's a five millimeter incision. And then um, this can stay a five. I've pulled out an entire lobe through a five millimeter incision before, um, or you extend it big enough to get the incision out or the lobe out. So depending on kind of how solid, how cystic, this one was the... Um, that one with the big cyst. So once it decompressed, you could pull that lobe right out. So kids re recover very well from these thoracoscopic surgeries. If they're symptomatic, it's gonna be safer to just do a thoracotomy and get that lo lobe out, right? Kind of get in, get out. Uh, also single lung ventilation. So one of the very challenging things with these operations is talking with your anesthesiologist and having pediatric anesthesiologists that are very experienced with doing thoracoscopic surgery. And then, um, the timing we talked about, really it's another important thing is what works best for the family. So if I do it at three months or five months, that doesn't really matter. So like, hey, you guys have a big vacation coming up or you have whatever life event, you know, you wanna work in that, in that standpoint. Muscle sparing thoracotomy versus VATS. At this point, it's probably about 50-50, kind of who's doing what. Um, a lot's just kind of training and what people are comfortable with. And they haven't really found, you know, a lot of things we're looking at haven't really found differences. So one difference is the cosmetic aspect. Um, when we are doing, going through the muscle, then you get more scoliosis, uh, scapular winging. You worry about their development as they grow, but with muscle sparing, it's, that's pretty low. Um, typically we're doing a lobectomy. Sometimes we can do a segmentectomy. There's a lot of kind of other things to talk about with that. All right. Um, the biggest thing about doing a segmentectomy, like specifically for a CPAM, is there can be residual lesion outside of that segment. So we typically just recommend a lobectomy. Um, the other thing is really figuring out like which part you resect for a segment is a little bit tough. All right. So how do we do these operations in a tiny baby? This is the boulder equipment that I was talking about. So this is called um, cool seal. And then just right is a five millimeter stapler. So now they make five millimeter staplers and three millimeter sealers. So this is a three millimeter sealing device. Um, the main thing about it versus like a five millimeter sealer is it's not a divider. So it just seals, um, but it doesn't seal and cut. They haven't, we keep telling them to like come up with this, but it's a little bit hard to, hard to do in that um, little size. But they also make a five millimeter. So the five millimeter is a Trinity. And I've talked to you, I know, 
and I, and I ask guys about it because at some point you guys should really try to get it here. Um, I really like it. So I know Phil's used the Trinity with me and I, Connor, I didn't see, I know he has, too. oh, there you are. You've used it too. You guys like it, didn't like it? What did you say? I think it's great. Yeah, so compared to the Ligature, I think the biggest thing is it's a smaller, finer tip. So it's a much like thinner tip on the instrument and it doesn't have the thermal spread. So you guys notice that, right? So when you're sealing, you're not getting like all this tissue being pulled in. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's nice, <laughs> but anyway, it's expensive, of course. Um, yeah, exactly. And so once you guys have the equipment for the five millimeter, then I can get the three millimeter because it's the same box, you know? Uh, and then there's also a handheld one too. So kind of same thing compared to like the ligature or the harmonic. It's just a very, like, it's, it's more of a delicate, I think, dissector. Like, um, that was what we talked about with when we were doing a spleen with the five is just being able to use it as your Maryland too, versus the ligature makes a big difference. So if you've never heard of it, something to kind of look into, but, um, yeah, money. So. All right, that's versus lobectomy. So it's non-inferiority of a lobectomy, a lower complication rate. Really, we're seeing this rising rate with the experience and learning curve. So now as, as more of us are coming out of training, having done VATS lobectomies and coming out of general surgery training, doing more minimally invasive stuff, right? We're kind of, you're seeing that shift more into an MIS standpoint. Um, what is that? <laughs> so, uh, they, hey, they get a, you know, <laughs> um, they get back to playing on their play mat, um, taking a little bit longer to do a thoracoscopically learning curve, right? Um, what other differences did they see? Is they saw more ICU admissions with thoracoscopy, probably just again experience and comfort levels. Um, a lot less epidurals. So from a pain standpoint, really you don't even need to give babies epidurals or thoracotomies. They recover quite well from a thoracotomy standpoint. Um, but still from a pain standpoint, I think it's better with a thoracoscopy. And then um, if you have no air leak at the end, so if the fissure is really nice, I think some people are, have you ever not left a chest tube in a lobe? Yeah, so some people are even not like not even leaving chest tubes. I haven't gotten that ballsy yet, but um, taking out that chest tube that night and or water sealing it that night, removing it the next morning. So getting kids out of the hospital very quickly. Let's see. And then this was a different article. And what else? Again, the epidural use, so opioid doses. So not needing any, any narcotics. Um, Tylenol and local anesthesia works great. Um, does anybody know what age you can use Xperl down to? Six. I believe it's FDA certified for six. Is that right? You don't know. I tried to use it once for like a four or five year old that someone's told no. So I'm pretty sure it's six, but. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think it's literally just they haven't done FDA approvals low enough. Is, is, there, is there a mortality associated with this or is like another, like an apple death? Uh, uh, yeah, I would say it should never happen, but, um, you know, definitely bleeding is probably the biggest concern. Um, and then there's things you don't think about. Like I had a kid who I did a lobe on one side and the pick you blew out the other side with bagging and had a pneumothorax on that side and took a while to recover but did fine. Are you talking about mortality from the CPM or from the operation? Or both? Well, from the operation. Like if you have yeah. a baby Yes, uh, <laughs> it's not like an Abby. I do a lot of Abby's. Uh, I think the biggest thing is just like, you know, I've heard of misfiring of staplers on like 
big, very proximal blood vessels. Yeah, bleeding is the biggest, scariest risk for sure. I've heard of one that was like a post bleed and then they couldn't find anything, but then the kid developed like trolley and had a bunch of other stuff happen. And how many of these do you do? Ooh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, so that goes into the whole debate too of like high volume, low volume places. Um, but I mean, I've, I had like a run of like prenatal diagnoses. Um, but I mean, I've done a few, I guess. So um, it's definitely not like you want to be doing them more often, obviously. Um, who has this app? I see a couple. Okay. So bef especially before you guys do your peds rotation, download this app. It's free. It's the Stay Current Pediatric Surgery app. It's really, really good for video specifically. So if you're, and again, and thinking about like how I approach these operations, these are the kind of operations where like a few nights before, like I'm watching videos, I'm reviewing all the anatomy. I'm like staring at the CT scan, figuring out what could go wrong and things like that. Because, you know, versus a thoracoscopic or a, versus like a CT surgeon who may be doing a lobectomy a lot more frequently, I'm not. So this app though, they have podcasts, they have different like learning points. Um, it's just, it's free and it's a good resource. And then we'll just quickly, what time is it? There we go. Uh, so just to show you guys this um, instrument that I was talking about mostly. Do it. Periodically, we will be uploading videos from experts around the world. Approximately the fifth intercostal space in the posterior axillary line. The right and left hand operating ports are in the anterior axillary line. The scope is put in and an initial evaluation is done. The right hand operating port is then placed just above the diaphragm in the anterior axillary line. So that's a reusable three, three millimeter, millimeter port trocar. is placed, and this will later be upsized to a five for the five millimeter state. They threw away here, but the initial are, moves yes. are to mobilize the inferior pulmonary ligament. This is done for two reasons. Oop, crap. Messed it up. Help. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Dan. Thanks. Help uh, me. Uh, certainly an honor to be chosen to participate in the Sages University. All right, so why do we start with the inferior pulmonary ligament? What are you looking for, despite having or not having uh, imaging? From... This is Todd Ponsky Thank from you, African sir. Children's Hospital, and <laughs> so today we're starting a new project like called How I Do It. Periodically, we'll be uploading videos from. Yeah, there you go. Permitly. It should be um, removed and cleaned gently by the uh, scrub. After the superior segmental artery is so exposed, so this is working. You so you can see how beautiful this fissure is, right? So this is what you're hoping for as you get in, and you're like, ah, I can see all the branches of the PA, like right there. Fissure is still incomplete at this point, and so. In this area where there's lung parenchyma, we see. Yeah, seal so this is only a sealer. So it's a three millimeter sealer, and you can do a lot of like sealing and kind of pulling versus coming in and using scissors. Seal, or in cases where the tissue is thicker, we I often make so. two separate seals both. Cut between them. For sure, both. So coming around the vessel. Uh, sub, 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 sub segmental branch. Of the, what is that? It can. Yeah. And and that's where I, you know, talk about chest tubes and things like that is like how much of a fissure are you having to create? And so sometimes, especially in these little babies, like, I mean, they just have beautiful fissures that are like, you can see here, you can see every branch of the PA. 
Um, there's different ways to control these. So the when you're really out into the segments, you can just seal, seal and divide um, versus using, you know, clips. Uh, anterior basal segment trap. Okay. So there's no bleeding, then we continue, complete the division of the vessel. Yeah. And so these branches, you just seal and then cut in between the two seals as a test seal to make sure you're not going to bleed. Here we can see a large lymph node. That's a lymph node that's kind of just bleeding. And he'll talk about that. He thinks, so this is Steve Rothenberg. He does a ton of thoracoscopic stuff. He's kind of like, if you look up any videos, you're going to see his name. Um, but he'll talk about here that he thinks all these lymph nodes and this inflammation are a lot bigger, like if the kid is even a year old. And then, so I'm gonna show you guys. So one of the big differences, thoracoscopic versus open, is we tend to take the arteries and then now you see the bronchus, the branches of the bronchus coming around. And then uh, compress the bronchi. Bronchi may be too large for- And then, you can take that with a stapler, the five millimeter stapler. If you've ever tried to get a 12 millimeter st stapler in, I've tried in like a one-year-old chest, it's really painful. It's, it's very big. And I think last I used it in like a four-year-old's chest and it was really big and painful. And then, um, so the five millimeter stapler is good for that. Inserted. I've used WEC clips or the Hemolock clips on the branches of the bronchus and that worked actually really well. That was a kid who, when they blew out the other side, I was like, oh, like, thank you to the clips for, they worked, <laughs> these two of them. But, and then lastly, we go and take the vein. So talk about kind of, um, now the vein's a low pressure system, but it's still a little terrifying when you're looking at the heart right there and you have a you know, very short uh, distance between the, the lobe and the heart. pulmonary vein, the main trunk. Taking down some of the last uh, oral reflections uh, to get better exposure and create more length. Okay, let's see what the fissure is complete. So, and now you can see, right, see heart uh, the right heart below. And then pulmonary vein, and then lifting up and making sure you have enough room that if you have a misfire on your stapler, you can do something about it. A bit more uh, surrounding uh, and tissue is removed. Also true. Giving us yeah. greater length. All right. Where did my cursor go? There it is. Now, Another application of the stapler to be used. Yeah, so again, you can it's see a here. To make sure that the staple line is well away from the base of the vein, well away from the pericardium. All right. So that gives an idea of that. There. What are they? Two. Two rows. I actually, I did not use that stapler in fellowship, so no. We don't have them. They do. Chosa and University. Yep. No, we haven't convinced them yet. But people do. I, I mean, they tried to sell it to us with like doing it appies and like, we don't really need it for appies, but um, people will do bowel anastomoses with the five too, but, and I haven't really done too much, but, but that's a good thought of this. If we can at least get the cool seal at Methodist and I'll use it. Yes. Yep. It's a sealer cutter. It's like the exact same as ligature, except a finer tip and less spread. All right. All right. So, so again, get this app. And then, did we ever have luck with getting um, the not a textbook for the residents? Yeah, through the library. Um, so I believe they have a textbook for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
for the coming year? Okay. Awesome. So that's their other main res like easy resource is if you look up eAPSA or a, like the APSA, not a textbook or NAT. And I know we were working on getting it through the library. So if it's not done yet, it should be for the next year then. Um, that's just kind of a more up to date and you know, look up any topic. They usually have links, a link back to like score. They have questions on there too. And just any topic you want, like if you're looking up stuff on a case. And then you can try to get, because once like you have access to it, you can get it on your phone. It's a Ped Surge library is the link, um, but that's actually the app for that, not a textbook. So once you have access to it, you should be able to get the Ped Surge library app. And then between those two, like that's a very good starting point for looking stuff up. All right, so anesthesia risks, we kind of talked about this a little bit, that single lung ventilation, um, they're, you know, you can main stem intubate down into the other side. I've had an anesthesiologist like literally holding the ET tube for almost the whole case because it's a difference of a couple millimeters, right? The other problem is if you kind of, once you divide stuff and get any kind of schmoo in that tube, kids can struggle and you need to be re-intubating and they're on their side. So that can make anesthesiologists nervous too, right? From a re-intubation standpoint and everything. Um, in a emphysematous or that overinflated lung, they can get really sick really fast with positive pressure ventilation. Um, in a CPAM, or not in a CPAM, sorry, in a CLE or a congenital lower overinflation, you need to be preparing for a thoracotomy like right during intubation. And those kids we don't do thoracoscopically. And then the chest tube and pain control. So uh, we need to start speeding up. So BPS is that abnormal budding of this um, lobe in the foregut embryology, 10% of the prenatal lung diagnosed lung malformations. It's a portion of the lung that does not connect to the tracheobronchial tree. So intralobar, so if they don't connect to the tracheobronchial tree, how do these kids get their infections in the intralobar BPS? What are those little connections called that you have to the lung? Yeah, I heard it somewhere. Good, pours a con, right? So they can still get those recurrent pneumonias. And then extra lobar is a later of experience and that's totally extra plural. It's kind of like an extra little cute lobe just hanging out in the lung. Uh, they both have systemic arterial supply. Intralobars have a normal pulmonary venous drainage. Extralobar can drain either way. So they can drain back into the systemic blood flow or back into the pulmonary uh, venous system. And this is why postnatal imaging is really important. So it can show you like, hey, there's these three main, you know, systemic arteries going to this lesion, for instance. Um, most of them connect to the dorsal aorta around that and the lung bud. They gradually absorb when separating from the lung tissue. If not absorbed, then that's where you get that residual vasculature. And then the intra versus extra lobar just depends on the timing. And you can see what's more common here. You can also have it within the diaphragm or in the abdomen, so right below the diaphragm. This was a hybrid CPAM BPS. So you can see this, these blood vessels are coming. Um, off the aorta down here. So there's these two big systemic blood vessels coming in to the lower lobe. Uh -uh. And they, that just kind of shows the cystic component too. So this mixed cystic solid component. Intralobar, the feeding vessel is usually within the inferior pulmonary ligament. So again, start with that inferior pulmonary ligament and you're finding that feeding vessel. Rarely needed, but you can talk about coiling, embolizing that feeding vessel, that specifically if a kid is having high output cardiac failure and like you can't safely get to the OR or you need time or whatever, you can talk about that as an option. Um, they can have hemoptysis and they can have that difficult to control vessel. Risk of infection is that bacterial seeding from the pores and then abscess formation. 
So this was an incidental bilateral sequestration. Bilateral sequestration. So over on the left, they had this feeding vessel coming off the aorta, so coming up through the diaphragm. And then this was a abnormal cystic appearing portion of the lobe. And then as I was reviewing the radiology, a different radiologist look, looking at it and was like, wait, what about this vessel over here on the right? So this kid has gotten a segmentectomy on this side. And the only reason we did a segmentectomy is in case we need to do something over on the right side, which haven't fully decided on, but Here's another picture of the left. So this kid is actually going to get a VQ scan. So I feel like in residency, I always learned about VQ scans and I've never once ordered one, but now I have. Um, and the reason we're doing that is really to look at, hey, is this kind of this incidental vessel, but all the lung tissue looks fine. It has normal perfusion and ventilation, and we're just going to not do anything. But if there's a segment that's abnormal there, then we'll do a segmentectomy on that side. This was an appy, the perfed appy that resulted in this. All right, extra lobar sequestration is no connection. It's surrounded by separate pleural covering. It can be again in the chest, diaphragm, subdiaphragm. Um, it can be differenti difficult to differentiate from any other prenatal lung lesion, so or prenatal mass, I should say, so like a neuroblastoma. And then what's the risk with these? Because they're not connected to the lung, right? So less worried. Anybody have any ideas? Not really. No. So we don't really know. Like we could probably just watch most of these and they're probably fine. There's reports of torsion. So they twist on this little pedicle. There's reports of bleeding. And then since we think it's all a big spectrum, we're not sure is there kind of a malignancy risk or infection risk and how do you monitor it? Um, this kid. There it was, whoops, sorry. But so this prenatally they thought was a neuroblastoma. So we had a bunch of workup done as a baby. But it's right down by the hiatus there. So, so what to do about them? Do you observe them or do you resect them? Typically it's a fairly easy operation. So talking about like the the risks from mortality and things like that. Again, it's a systemic blood flow, but it's kind of usually these little pedicle, you just kind of clip both and take it out. And now with thoracoscopic surgery too, you don't really need, you don't need a chest tube and the kid can kind of be in and out. So it's a lower risk surgery for something that we don't really know what'll happen, but is there associated CPAM, malignant degeneration, difficult to monitor. So this is an example of the extra lobar. So you can see how it really kind of looks like this extra little lobe. So it's completely separate from the rest of the lower lobe. So diaphragm, lower lobe, and then this little sequestration. And you can see the little pedicle coming to it. All right, quickly talk about CLE or now called congenital lobar overinflation. So um, overinflation with compression of the adjacent lungs, it can result from dysplastic bronchial cartilage. 50% um, of the time, the case causes unknown. Left upper lobe is the most common than the right upper lobe, right middle lobe. They can present with respiratory distress, 50% um, within one month of age, or they can be completely asymptomatic. So here's one example of a left upper lobe um, lesion. This could have had tachypnea, and you can see how big really and over distended that is. And then um, this is kind of a poor image, but the main thing to know about these is what could somebody very easily misdiagnose one of these kids with when they come into the ER with some respiratory distress and have a really big black area. Pneumothorax, right? So if somebody really quickly looks at this x-ray, you can say, oh shit, this kid has bad pneumothorax and shove a chest tube right into this overinflated huge lobe of the lung. So got to actually look and see like, oh, there's lung markings there and it's a congenital lobar overinflation. We do a lobectomy for symptoms. Again, this is more of an open resection and the risk is that positive pressure ventilation and over inflation again, and they can actually decompensate on induction. The other risk people do with, or the other bad thing that can happen to these kids is that they get like 
CPAP put on them basically, or positive pressure blown in them. So getting a positive head nod in the back. So they come in, they're having some respiratory distress. That's the natural response, right? Is like, oh, give them some positive pressure, give them some oxygen. That's gonna make all their symptoms worse because they're getting compression of the other side by this overinflated lung. And you can see how it's, it's still pink, the specimen. So it's kind of this, you know, not shriveled up little lobe of a lung, but overinflated. Um, bronchial atresia is really a segment of the lung that's overinflated. It's becoming more frequently diagnosed. And then what to do with these is a big debate. There was actually just an article um, published very recently that I was reading last night on um, Michigan's experience. Because we're seeing all these prenatal diagnosed lesions and then they resolve, we're getting all these CT scans. Well, now this is being diagnosed and we don't really know what to do with it. So in that case, they observed 22 out of 28 kids in the last, from 2014 to 2020. 20. Um, two of them converted over to the operative management by having recurrent pneumonias, basically, or pneumonias. So again, we're not really sure, but this is that abnormal area of the lung. The concern about observing them is they can have elements of CPAM on their resected specimen, and then you put them in all those risks of CPAM. Um, Bronchogenic cysts. Abnormal budding of the tracheal diverticulum may or may not communicate, variety of locations. So this is 6% of all mediastinal masses, can be prenatally diagnosed or postnatally. They can have dysphagia, bronchial airway obstruction. In adults, 80% are symptomatic uh, with all these things you can see. But a lot of times, it's kind of that dysphagia putting pressure on, on that. So there's one example. Resect it when identified, either bats or with a thoracotomy. And then they can have a shared wall. So just resect the mucosal lining um, and just be aware that, you know, they could have that shared wall between either the tracheobronchial or the esophagus. Right. And then we're basically at eight. This is all just extra stuff if there's time, but empyemas, get a lot of consoles for empyemas. How do you treat an empyema in a kid? There's two ways. Yeah, I'm guessing you saw a few of these consoles, right? That's kind of the time frame. What did you mostly see from a management standpoint? Oh, really? It's good to know. What was that? Oh, it was with you. Okay, so. Uh, chest tube and TPA versus VATS. I think the group in town does a lot more VATS for empyemas. So that's why I asked the question. Um, the outcomes really are the same. One of our big studies showed that the difference is cost, that it's cheaper to do chest tube and TPA. Um, also, if you can do a chest tube with like a little sedation in the PICU or whatever, you know, then you're saving a kid general anesthesia and a trip to the operating room. Some of the argument to just doing the VATS is if you're in an institution where you have to take the kid to the OR anyway to like get a chest tube in on, then stick a scope in and clean it out. But either one is works. Uh, important to know is the chest x-ray is gonna be abnormal for a really long time. So you'll keep getting called being like, their chest x-ray still looks bad. Their chest x-ray still looks bad. It doesn't matter if they're not having fevers anymore and they're otherwise doing well that's gonna lag and then they can follow up with Dr. Welsh for a repeat chest x-ray. Bad empyemas, nematocils, bronchiectasis, chylothorax. Um, I wouldn't know for chylothorax, your initial treatment. What's the initial treatment? Not going straight to thoracic duct ligation. Dr. Rowland, hello. How do you initially treat a chylothorax? MPO. Okay. So, um, what kind of diet? If you're gonna start a diet, not Alex, somebody else. I heard it. Medium chain, right? So long goes to lymphatics. So avoid the long chain fatty acids and from that diet. Um, but if you need to, you know, then there's other things you can do like thoracic duct ligation kind of stuff. And then spontaneous pneumothorax, webs. That's a whole different talk. This is a very old picture, but 
listening to unicorn's lungs. Questions? <laughs> 